our second lecture in the series will be on antidysrhythmic drugs. By the end, you should be able to describe the targets and mechanisms of action of major classes of antidysrhythmic drugs, giving named examples. You should also be able to compare and contrast the mechanisms of action, pharmacokinetics and side effects of these drugs, giving named examples. In the last lecture, we mentioned how some dysrhythmias can arise. In particular, we mentioned how channels can open or close when they are not supposed to. Therefore, in order to treat these dysrhythmias, we need to be able to block this from happening. This slide shows how antidysrhythmic drugs are classified, as well as some examples from each class. This is called the Vaughan Williams classification system. From this table, we can see that class 1 drugs mainly block sodium channels, but to varying degrees, which is why class 1 drugs are also subclassified into class 1A, class 1B, and class 1C. Class 2 drugs target beta adrenergic receptors. Class 3 drugs target potassium channels and class 4 drugs target calcium channels. This table also shows digitalis and adenosine, but I'd prefer to discuss uh, digitalis in the next lecture for its effects on contractility. In each case, it's important to ask what the effects of each of these classes are on both the SA nodal cell action potentials and the myocardial cell action potentials. This slide shows the uh, channels that are targeted by each of the classes um, and on the diagram you can see these on the plasma membrane. Uh, class 1 drugs block the influx of sodium ions uh, in the cell, class uh, 2 drugs block the beta adrenergic receptors and prevent its signaling via cyclic AMP, class 3 drugs as we said block the efflux of potassium ions and class 4 drugs block the influx of calcium ions. As both nodal and myocardial cells are affected by ion movements, these drugs will affect their action potentials, but in slightly different ways, as we'll see. This slide gives a nice visual summary of the effect on the action potentials. As we can see on the top left, class 1 drugs tend to have their greatest effect on the myocardial action potential, as if you remember from the first lecture, sodium influx only slightly changed the nodal action potential in phase 4, but caused a major spike in the myocardial action potential in phase 0. Therefore, if you block sodium channels, they tend to affect this spike the most. The different subclasses shown uh, on the slide um, illustrate slight differences which are important clinically. Class 1A, shown in, in, uh, in yellow, lengthen the action potential compared to the normal responses in red, slightly shifting the phase zero spike to the right and also shifting the later phases. Class 1B drugs, shown in purple, shorten the action potential compared to the normal red response. Um, on the, gra the graph on the uh, top right, class 1C drugs, shown in, green, in the green line, don't have an overall effect on the action potential duration, but they do affect the waveform compared to the normal red line response shown in the graph. On the bottom left of the slide, class 2 drugs tend to have their greatest effect on the nodal action potential. You'll see that the waveform here is slightly different. That's indicative of the nodal action cell, uh, cell action potential. Um, and uh, beta blockers, which are uh, class 2 drugs, uh, shown in the dashed line, decrease the rate of phase 4 in the nodal action cell potential compared to the normal yellow line response which is what normally initiates the nodal action potential. And this is what uh, the effect is. It should slow the uh, heart rate overall. Class three drugs shown in the middle at the bottom um, have their greatest effect on myocardial action potentials. So if you remember from the previous lecture, potassium efflux was responsible for decreasing the membrane potential in phases one, two, and three of the myocardial action potential. By blocking these, the action potential gets lengthened in the center to part in particular of the curve, as shown in the purple line compared to the normal red line response. Finally, in class four, uh, calcium channel blockers are um, 
kind of called class four drugs, and they tend to affect the nodal action potential the most. Because if you remember again from the last lecture, calcium influx is responsible for the increase in membrane potential in phase zero of the nodal cells. This is blocked by a specific class of channel as calcium channel blocker, as shown uh, with the black line, and it decreases the conduction velocity compared to the normal yellow line response. In the previous lecture, we mentioned some possible dysrhythmias that can arise. This table shows some of the examples of the drugs that are used to treat these conditions, such as tachycardia or atrial fibrillation. We will now look at some of the drug classes in more detail and discuss the examples uh, shown on the right of the slide. As we've said already, class 1 drugs block voltage sent sensitive sodium channels and this leaves fewer of these channels available to open in response to a depolarization event such as an electrical signal that they might receive. <clears throat> an example of one of these uh, sodium channels is shown in the diagram on the right of the slide, illustrating each of the different states. In a resting state, it is closed and it is impermeable to ion movement. However, when it changes, when it senses a change in the membrane potential and when it reaches the required thre threshold, uh, it changes its conformation, as can be seen by the movement of the inactivation gate and the activation gate. And this um, uh, and this um, changes uh, the conformation to allow the uh, ions into the cell. So once this uh, potential has, has changed following the influx of, of sodium ions, it then closes again. So the, um, the uh, inactivation gate closes back over um, the actual channel on the in intracellular portion. Um, so in these um, SA nodal cells, while not being the predominant effect, it decreases the automaticity and it shifts the action potential threshold to more positive potentials. It decreases the slope in the initial phase four depolarization. Um, so in ventricular cardiomyocytes, which we've said is the predominant effect, it, uh, it decreases the upstroke velocity of phase zero, while some of the drugs in class one in particular prolong the repolarization. It also increases the effective refractory period of the cells. So cells in a re-entrant circuit cannot be depolarized again by a re-entrant current. The effective refractory period is essentially just the time between which it become, it, the cells can become responsive to a new impulse. Sodium channel blockers decrease the likelihood of re-entry and thereby prevent arrhythmia by decreasing conduction velocity and increasing the refractory period, as we've said. So as we have seen, class one drugs can be broken up into subclasses according to their slightly different effects they have on action potentials. And the mechanism of action for class 1A is that they exert moderate block on sodium channels and prolong the repolarization of both the SA nodal cells and the ventricular uh, myocytes. They decrease the phase zero upstroke velocity in myocardial cells, which decreases conduction throughout the myocardium. Class 1A drugs also have the ability to block potassium channels and thereby they reduce the outward potassium current responsible for repolarization of the membrane. Examples of such drugs include quinidine, procainamide and disopyramide. In terms of their clinical uses, they can be used to treat atrial, AV junctional, and ventricular dysrhythmias. Some of these drugs also have specific unique features to them that we will discuss. Quinidine, for example, also um, exerts uh, anticholinergic or vagolytic effects by blocking potassium channels that are opened upon uh, M2 muscarinic stimulation in the AV node. In terms of its pharmacokinetics, it is administered orally and metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzymes in the liver. It uh, can increase the plasma levels of digoxin uh, also, which could be important, um, as we'll see in the next lecture when we come to talk about cardiac contractility. Uh, plasma levels of potassium need to be monitored also, as hypokalemia, which is a, a potassium deficiency, 
reduces the efficacy of quinidine. Its side effects include diarrhea, nausea, headache and dizziness. And it is contraindicated for those with prolonged QT syndrome. This can be inherited genetically or it can occur with the treatment with some other medications. Procainamide, the second example we have, is effective in the treatment of supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. It can be used to safely decrease the likelihood of re-entrant arrhythmias following myocardial infarction or heart attack. <clears throat> it can be administered by slow infusion to treat acute uh, ventricular tachycardia. Unlike quinidine, it has few anticholinergic effects and does not alter the plasma levels of digoxin, but it can cause peripheral vasodilation via inhibition of the sympathetic ganglia. And we'll be coming across this again later in our lecture series. Regarding its pharmacokinetics, um, it is acetylated in the liver to a metabolite called N-acetylprocainamide or NAPA. And this is an active metabolite and can produce the class 3 effect of prolonging the refractory period and lengthening the QT in interval. Disoparamide, on the other hand, is similar to quinidine in its mechanism of action, but different in its adverse effects. Um, it seems to cause fewer gastrointestinal problems, but has more profound anticholinergic effects than quinidine, leading to uh, urinary retention and dry mouth, which is related to its apparent action as a muscarinic uh, antagonist. It is therefore contraindicated for patients with obstructive um, uropathy and glaucoma, as well as those with conduction block. Oral uh, disoparamide is approved only for life-threatening uh, ventricular arrhythmias. In contrast to class 1A drugs, which bind to open sodium channels, class 1B drugs bind to open and inactivated channels, as can be seen on the diagram on the right. They display a mild channel block with fast dissociation from the channels. They are most useful in blocking depolarized or rapidly driven tissues, and they exhibit use-dependent block in the disease myocardium, for example, during ischemia, where cells have a greater tendency to fire more often, um, and has a let this this drug has a, a little effect in healthy um, tissue. Examples from this class include lidocaine, uh, mexilatine, and uh, phenytoin. Our first example, lidocaine alters uh, ventricular action potential by blocking sodium channels and sometimes by shortening repolarization due to the blockage of the few sodium channels that inactivate late during phase two of the action potential. Clinically, it is used to treat uh, ventricular arrhythmias in emergencies but not effective against supraventricular arrhythmias. And it is safe to use for patients with prolonged QT syndrome because it shortens repolarization. Looking at its pharmacokinetics, it has a short half-life, around 20 minutes, and it is deethylated in the liver. Plasma levels can be reduced by other drugs, such as phenytoin, for example, due to inducing a P450 enzymes. This is what we call a drug-drug interaction. Finally, its side effects include confusion, dizziness, and seizures due to some CNS uh, effects. Our second example in the class is uh, mexilatine, which is an analog of lidocaine with similar efficacy. It does not prolong the QT interval and it lacks vagolytic effects. Its clinical uses include life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, but is often used as an adjunct to other te therapies, for example, with amiodarone. Looking at its pharmacokinetics, it undergoes liver metabolism and its levels are affected by inducers of P450 enzymes, such as phenytoin. Its side effects include dose-related nausea and tremor. And uh, phenytoin um, is our third example in this class. Um, it's normally better known as an anti-epileptic medication, but it does have effects on the myocardium. Clinically, it is effective in ventricular tachycardia of young children and those with congenital prolonged QT syndrome. For its pharmacokinetics, it is an inducer of cytochrome P453A4 in the liver, and therefore it can affect the plasma levels of other antidysrhythmic drugs, such as members of its own class, mexilatine and lidocaine. <clears throat> 
and also quinidine. Our third uh, subclass is class 1C, and these drugs are the most potent sodium channel blockers, um, as can be see, seen on the diagram on the right. They suppress uh, premature ventricular contractions by decreasing the rate of phase 1 upstroke. Examples in this class include flacanide, uh, encanide, and prop propofenone. Its clinical uses include the treatment of uh, paroxysmal uh, supraventricular tachycardia and for atrial fibrillation. However, it's only used in life-threatening situations. It can worsen arrhythmias at normal doses in those with a pre-existing ventricular tach tachyrrhythmia or who have a history of myocardial infarction or heart attack. It has slow elimination kinetics with a plasma half-life of between 12 and 30 hours. And its side effects include sinus node dysfunction, marked decreases in conduction velocity, and even in some cases, conduction block. Class two drugs act by inhibiting the sympathetic input into pacemaker cells of the heart. As we saw already, these drugs tend to affect nodal action potentials more than the action, the, my, the action potentials in the myocardium. They block the sympathetic stimulation of beta-1 adrenergic receptors in the SA and the AV node. However, the AV node is more sensitive than the SA node to the direct effects of beta-1 antagonists. Um, they affect the action potentials of the SA and AV nodal cells by decreasing the rate of phase 4 depolarization and also by prolonging repolarization. Decreasing the rate of phase 4 depolarization results in decreased automaticity at the SA node as is shown on the diagram on the right. Prolonged repolarization at the AV node increases the effective refractory period which, as we've said already, decreases the incidence of re-entry. Clinically, these are the most frequently used agents in the treatment of supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, resulting from sympathetic stimulation and have the most established uh, safety. Examples in this class include propranolol, atenolol, carvedilol. These can be broken up into different generations of drugs. The first generation beta antagonists such as propranolol are non-selective. They can antagonize beta-1 and beta-2 adrenergic receptors. They are also used to treat tachycardias induced by exercise or emotional stress. The second generation drugs include atenolol and metoprolol, etc. and they're relatively selective for beta-1 at low doses. The ter third generation antagonists cause vasodilation in addition, and these include uh, carbidilol. They uh, work, do this by antagonizing uh, alpha adrenergic receptors and mediated uh, vasoconstriction. The side effects for this class involve three general mechanisms. Beta 2 antagonism, for example, causes smooth muscle spasm and can lead to bronchospasm, cold extremities, and impotence in some cases. Exaggerated beta-1 antagonism can lead to excessive negative inotropic effects, heart block and bradycardia. And for some people, drug penetration of the CNS can produce insomnia and or depression. During a normal action potential, hyperpolarizing potassium currents dominate and returning the membrane potential to hyperpolarized values. Class 3 drugs, as we, as we said already, act by blocking these potassium channels. When this happens, a smaller hyperpolarizing current is generated, and therefore calcium ch or potassium channel blockers cause a longer plateau and prolong the repolarization, as is shown in the diagram on the top right. This prolongation increases the effective refractory period, which decreases the incidence of re-entry. However, this prolongation can also increase the likelihood of developing ap after polarizations, as what we saw yesterday, and torsa de point, the twisting of the points, as is illustrated in the diagram on the bottom right of the slide. Class 3 drugs can also exhibit reverse use dependency, meaning that an action potential prolongation is most pronounced at slow rates and least pronounced at fast rates.
An example of a class 3 drug is amiodarone. Um, it is mainly a class 3 agent, but can have class 1, 2 and 4 activity. It is frequently used to treat ventricular arrhythmias, especially in heart failure or in myocardial infarction or heart attack. It works by lengthening the effective refractory period by inhibiting the potassium channels responsible for repolarization. It also blocks sodium channels. That would normally be the work of a class 1 agent. It can antagonize alpha and beta adrenergic receptors, normally class 2 drugs we see those uh, occurring, as well as blocking calcium channels, which normally is what class 4 agents do. Its wide spectrum of, uh, spectrum of action is accompanied by several side effects, especially when used at high doses over long periods of time. And these can include cardiac, pulmonary, thyroid, hepatic and neurological conditions. In the heart, for example, it can cause AV nodal block and bradycardia by blocking calcium channels. It can also cause negative inotropic effects. This is referring to contractility, and we'll discuss that in the next lecture, by blocking beta adrenergic receptors. In the lungs, uh, pneumonitis can occur and can rarely lead to uh, pulmonary fibrosis. In the thyroid, in some people, it can lead to hypo or hyperthyroidism because of structural similarities that it has to thyroxine and can inhibit the conversion of thyroxine T4 to triiodothyronine T3. In the liver, it can lead to elevated liver enzymes, and this is normally reversible by adjusting the dose. And as I said, it can also have neurological effects, and these can include peripheral neuropathy, headache, ataxia, and tremor. Other members of this class include um, dronedrone, which is another example, and it is structurally, structurally similar to amiodarone, but less lipophilic. Therefore, it has a shorter half-life compared to amiodarone and less adverse effects. It also lacks iodine, so it's not associated with the thyroid side effects that we've just mentioned. Um, its side effects can include some liver toxicity and therefore should be monitored. Another example in this class is abutilide, which prolongs repolarization by inhibiting potassium channels, but also it can enhance a slow inward sodium current that prolongs the repolarization. Clinically, it is used to terminate atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter, and its side effects uh, include a prolonged QT interval. Finally, Sotolol, which is a mixed agent, it's a mix of a class 2 and a class 3 agent, it can exist in two isomeric forms. The L form is a non-selective beta antagonist with the both the L and the D isomers acting on uh, potassium channels as pa potassium channel blockers. Clinically, it is used to treat severe ventricular arrhythmias in those that can't tolerate amiodarone. It is also used to prevent recurrent atrial flutter or fibrillation, and it can cause fatigue, bradycardia, as well as induce the torsade de point or twisting of the points that we mentioned earlier. Class 4 drugs act by blocking calcium channels, preferentially in the nodal tissue in the SA and AV node, um, with little effect on muscle cells in the ventricles. This has to do with the particular type of calcium channels that are present in these cells, and they are distinct from the other types of calcium channels found elsewhere in the cardiovascular system. Pacemaker cells depend on calcium currents, as we saw in the last lecture, for the depolarization phase of the action potential. These drugs slow the action potential upstroke in AV nodal cells, leading to slowed conduction velocity throughout the AV node, as is shown in the diagram on the right. These drugs can block re-entrant arrhythmias in which AV node is a part of the re-entrant circuit. Examples from this class include verapamil, diltiazem, and these are part of a family of drugs called the dihydropyridines or DHPs, and we'll be discussing these again at a later stage in the lecture series. Clinically, they are used to treat re-entrant paroxysomal uh, supraventricular tachycardias because they often involve the AV node. They have a good oral absorption and liver metabolism. They can increase plasma digoxin levels by competing with digoxin for renal uh, excretion. Side effects for class 4 agents include AV nodal block, 
by reducing the conduction velocity in an excessive way. While technically not in a class of its per se in the, in the system, uh, adenosine is included in the Vaughan Williams system that we saw at the start. It is produced naturally by the body and has effects on breathing, cardiac muscles and platelets. It can also bind to specific receptors called adenosine receptors, of which there are a couple of different types. A1 receptors are present in the AV nodal cells as is shown in the diagram at the right. And these A1 receptors are linked to cardiac potassium channels, which um, is a form of potassium channel that is activated by acetylcholine. Adenosine hyperpolarizes cardiac conducting tissue and slows the rate of rise of the pacemaker potential. That's phase four, as we saw in the, in the last lecture. Clinically, it is used for supraventricular tachycardia. And in the clinic, it is given IV, usually with a duration of action of about 15 seconds. Finally, I've included this slide at the end for comparison purposes. I don't intend to go through it in detail, but just to highlight that it is useful com for comparing the pharmacokinetics of the drugs we discussed and can be useful to consult when making clinical decisions about therapies for patients with uh, dysrhythmias.